Blue Origin filed a patent for its Starship-like upper stage, India's moon mission is on its way, and NASA might have a big budget problem on its hands. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 21st of July, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Sponsored by Brilliant. Last Friday, Japan was faced with a concerning incident as the second stage of the Epsilon-S rocket exploded during a critical test on the test stand. The Epsilon-S, one of Japan's smallest rockets, was undergoing an evaluation of its second stage when the unexpected explosion occurred. The test was important for the Epsilon-S and was meant to focus specifically on analyzing the performance of its upgraded second stage. The Epsilon-S is the new upgraded version of JAXA's 590 kilos to sun-synchronous orbit launch vehicle. In addition to an upgraded second stage, the first stage is a side booster taken from the new H3 rocket, similar to how the Vega C first stage is an Ariane 6 side booster. The third stage has been made mandatory on all Epsilon S flights, as opposed to it being optional on the older Epsilon model. The force of the blast also inflicted significant damage to the test stand, a crucial piece of infrastructure specifically designed to evaluate the rocket's performance under vacuum conditions. However, with the damage sustained in the explosion, JAXA now faces the additional challenge of needing to repair or replace this infrastructure. The last flight of the Epsilon family failed to achieve orbit after an attitude control fault that resulted in the flight termination system being activated. This latest incident definitely won't add confidence to this vehicle's reliability, but it is the reason that we test. You'd rather have an explosion on the ground than in the air. This week, Blue Origin published that it had filed for a patent on the reusable rocket upper stage design, following in the footsteps of their now-expired 2014 patent on the recovery of a first stage on a drone ship out at sea. This patent application was actually filed approximately 18 months ago, but it takes a while for these documents to make their way through the system, and it's just now been released to the public. The application shows a reusable upper stage design using an aerospike engine at the base that is also actively cooled during re-entry, like Stokes Base's rocket, with some subtle differences. It's likely that this design will be used as the rear end of Jarvis, Blue's reusable second stage, which we've seen in development through our Cape flyovers. According to the document, Blue would use the power packs of two BE-3U engines to provide the power to the aerospike engine. The combustion chambers also appear to be similar in size and design to the BE-7 engine combustion chamber. Now, while Blue Origin filed this patent application, it doesn't necessarily mean the company will pursue this design for Jarvis. As we've seen with Starship, Terran R, and also SLS, if you include Ares 5 in its lineage, rocket designs can change drastically from the drawing board. I'll also note that this patent hasn't been accepted yet, it's just been submitted and it is still pending. There's also a chance that it won't be approved, considering that aerospikes are not a new concept. They've been developed before. So stick around and we'll let you know what happens. Now let's toss it over to Sawyer for a quick word from our sponsor. How did you get here? No, not like how did life on Earth start, but how did you get to this video and the NASA Spaceflight YouTube channel? Well, there's a good chance it was recommended to you. How do those recommendations actually work? I found out using today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. I mean, there's thousands of lessons on different math, science, and technology topics. This one really stood out to me. As part of the course on how technology works, there's a really fascinating lesson on how recommendation engines work. You hear YouTubers all the time, sometimes us included, saying like, comment, and subscribe. But does it actually help? This course says yes. It turns out liking certain videos can help recommend it to friends especially if multiple people do it with something called collaborative filtering. Now, I don't want to spoil any more. You'll have to find out the rest for yourself by trying it out on brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or by clicking the link in the description below. That'll get you a 30-day free trial. The first 200 of you get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now, I have a good recommendation. How about sending it back to Alicia for more space news on Twist? And that definitely deserves a thumbs up. Thanks, Sawyer. And that's actually a great reminder to hit the like button on this video right now. And also subscribe to our channel for all of our amazing content and updates throughout the week. Be like Moss. Like and subscribe. Now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. A Falcon 9 lifted off on July 16th from Space Launch Complex 40 at 350 UTC. This mission carried the last batch of Starlink V1.5 satellites into low Earth orbit on the Starlink Group 515 mission. 
the booster for this mission, B-1060, was flying for the 16th time, joining fellow booster B-1058 on reaching this mark. Just like 58, this booster was successfully recovered on the drone ship A Short Fall of Gravitas. This mission had something of a troubled start, with a scrub on its first attempt on July 14th due to elevated oxygen levels in one of the Merlin engines under the first stage. The engine in question was checked, then teams performed a static fire test of the rocket on the pad to verify that it was safe for launch. As you can see, all went well for this booster, so we'll see you on your 17th flight, B-1060. A Kwaijo 1A lifted off on July 20th at 3.20 UTC from Site 95A at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying four Tianmu-1 spacecraft into a sun-synchronous orbit. The Tianmu-1 satellites are a part of a small constellation of small satellites used for weather research using radio signal occultation. Another Falcon 9 lifted off on July 20th at 4.09 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg. The rocket was carrying a batch of Starlink V-2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit for the Starlink Group 615 mission. The booster for this mission, B-1071, was flying for a tenth time, making it the ninth booster to reach that achievement. It successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You about eight minutes after launch. This was the first launch of Starlink V-2 mini-satellites from Vandenberg, and it included a rather interesting dog-like maneuver to insert these into a 43-degree inclination orbit. This also happened less than an hour after sunset, meaning the second stage went into sunlight as it headed into orbit, which left a lot of people in California and Mexico thinking that this was a UFO. Don't worry, it's just a SpaceX rocket. With the two Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has launched a total of 4,837 Starlink satellites, of which 3,741 are in their operational orbit. Rocket Lab launched again this week, and for this one, the booster came back. This Electron rocket lifted off on July 18th at 1.27 UTC from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 1B in New Zealand. The mission, called Baby Come Back, carried seven satellites for multiple customers into low Earth orbit. The main customer, NASA, had on board four Starling satellites. No, not Starlink, Starling satellites. These are designed to test technologies related to satellite swarms in orbit, exploring technologies for in-space network communications, onboard relative navigation between spacecraft, and more. Two Lemur-2 satellites from Spire were also on board, as well as the LEO-3 spacecraft from Telesat. For this launch, Rocket Lab attempted to recover the Electron booster, but the helicopter is no longer in the picture. It turns out that Peter Beck now agrees with the use of marine assets. And also, I can tell you 100% in full honesty, marine assets suck, like 100% suck. This booster had been modified to upgrade its water ceiling in order to facilitate its reuse. Rocket Lab aims to refly an engine by the end of the year and refly a whole booster next year. For that, these kinds of upgrades are crucial to avoid seawater intrusion into sensitive locations and corrosion of electronics and engine components. Through Electron's reuse, Rocket Lab can also learn about how to deal with reusability for carbon composite vehicles whilst the company develops its Neutron Medium Launch Vehicle. Now Rocket Lab managed to get a video signal all the way out in the Pacific, so we got to see them scoop up the booster live in addition to all of the images that we got once the SD cards had been returned to dry land. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. NASA's Mars Sample Return Mission might be in big budget trouble. The latest Senate Appropriations Report was released this week, and it contains the following quote. If NASA is unable to provide the committee with an MSR life cycle cost profile within the $5.3 billion cap, the mission is canceled. This mission has been struggling with cost increases and timeline slips, which is understandable considering the complexity of the mission. But this kind of language being passed in the U.S. Senate could mean that the mission might not have a long future ahead. The U.S. Space Force is looking at a third company to bring their most important satellites up into space. The upcoming National Security Space Launch Phase 3 contract is set to include two different kinds of launch acquisitions from different launch providers. The first one, dubbed Lane 1, will be open for any providers with a proven flight record. No other requirements while Lane 2, which is for more important and risk-averse missions, will only include rockets that can meet very stringent conditions to launch and deploy Space Force payloads. The second lane was originally planned to have two providers, but this week the Space Force is now opening the door to a third provider with a smaller set of missions awarded compared to the other two. 
Now the two main favorites for lane two are United Launch Alliance and SpaceX. So who do you think could win? This week, ISRO successfully tested the service module propulsion system of its Gaganyan crew vehicle. The service module contains five main engines for big maneuvers and 16 reaction control system thrusters for attitude control. This puts the agency just one step closer to flying this spacecraft next year. At the same time, the agency has released an update on the progress of its Chandrayaan-3 mission. The spacecraft is confirmed to be working successfully, and it's been performing its orbit-raising maneuvers nominally. It's currently performed four of these, now being in a 233 by 71,351 kilometer orbit. And now let's go over next week in spaceflight. A Series 1 rocket by Galactic Energy is set to launch next week in support of the mission dubbed Lemon Tree. Liftoff is scheduled to occur on July 22nd within a 66 minute long window that opens at 5 o'clock UTC. A Falcon 9 rocket will launch another batch of Starlink satellites next week from Florida. Liftoff is currently scheduled to occur within a 4 hour and 34 minute long window that opens on July 22nd at 2301 UTC. We're expecting a Changzheng 2D rocket to launch next week, carrying a yet unknown payload. Launch is set to occur within an 81 minute launch window that opens on July 23rd at 2.42 UTC. India is set to fly once again next week, with a PSLV rocket carrying the DSSAR satellite into orbit. Liftoff is planned to happen within a 4 hour launch window that opens on July 26th at 15 past midnight UTC. SpaceX's Falcon Heavy is set to come back next week, launching the Echo Star 24 satellite into geosynchronous transfer orbit. Liftoff is scheduled to occur within a 3 hour, 8 minute long window that opens on July 27th at 2.04 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to head to the link in the description for 20% off an annual premium subscription and a 30-day free trial. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.